Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Hartford at the Lewis and Clark State Historic Site at the rebuilt Camp Dubois. Many don't know that Lewis and Clark started their 1804 expedition here the winter before in 1803, an expedition that they knew not how long it would take nor where it would take them. Brad Wynn, it's a uh, kind of an extreme contrast because you see the, the introductory film right. to your tour here at the Lewis and Clark Historic Site. And then the first thing you see when you come out is this magnificent keel boat, which you have rebuilt. Right. A perfect replica, I guess perfect, as perfect as, as you can get. As best as we can determine, right, yeah. right. I mean, that's exactly what we were going for, is the last image you see of the film is the first image you see in this kind of wow moment as you walk into our main exhibit gallery. You know, for, for the first year that we were open, this was our main exhibit. This is what people remembered us as, is mm -hmm. the, the building with the keel boat. It's a full-scale replica. It's 55 feet long. Wow. It's 32 and a half feet high to the top of the mast, and I can attest to that because I've changed the light bulbs in here <laughs> but what's unique about our keel boat is it's cross section right down the keel so people mm -hmm. get a chance to see and there are other museums with replicas of keel boats in various sizes yeah. but none of them have a full replica of the keel boat cut right down the keel so people can see how it was packed people can see the supplies they brought with them they can see how they organize all those supplies which is an important mm -hmm. part of it because it's oftentimes what you see below the water line. planning was everything and we're going to get into that absolutely but before we go see that split keel boat you talk about what i love about this is you had to build this building to house this this keel boat because as you can see that the mast goes all the way to the top of the exactly building. I mean you you know people thought we were building a movie theater when we were first <laughs> under construction <laughs> what was unique about our building is you know more often than not on a museum you get a white box and then you figure out what I'm going to build inside that yeah, white box yeah. well here we designed this building as you exactly said to house the keel boat so mm -hmm. we've got to have a unique structure as far as the roof you've got to have a slant to the building because you are going to have this large sail here in the building you're going to mm -hmm. have this full replica of the boat it was designed specifically to house this boat. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting about that as well is the slope of the roof is very similar to the slope of the cabins at places like Camp River Dubois when they were here, Fort Mandan and Fort Clatsop. They all had that very similar slope to the mm -hmm. interior, which is how they designed and built these campsites. So there's a lot of subtle clues throughout the entire design of the building to give you images of for example, the point of the building to the west, yeah. or images yeah. of a keelboat or a campsite or things like Very that. Very imaginative, yes. and also it works, it makes suggestions to your sort of like, uh, your psyche. You're not really aware that that's what you're seeing, but you're getting suggestions all the time about the shapes of the buildings and everything that was here. And we're going to go back out later in the program and get to see the encampment, which was the first thing they built. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't know that Lewis and Clark started their journey west in Illinois. That's right. They had to do all their preparation work here. That's right. You know, Lewis and Clark basically spent more time in the state of Illinois, or what would become the state of Illinois, than any other site along the Lewis and Clark Trail except for North Dakota. Mm -hmm. and North North Dakota gets us because they're on the way there and on the way back. Mm -hmm. So they spent more time at Camp River Dubois, their first winter encampment, than any other spot along the trail other than Fort Mandan in North Dakota. And the key number here is they spent 48 hours longer there than they did here. So basically 152 days in Illinois mm -hmm. at Camp River Dubois, 154 days at Fort, uh, Fort Mandan. So most people don't recognize Illinois as a trail state. Yeah. I, I think you said 43 men uh, embarked on the journey? Correct. Okay. And what's nice is, okay, you split this keel boat in half and you get a chance to look right into one of the quarters. This may have been a captain's quarters. I don't know if all the men had, had quarters this good. but Right, right. Well, this particular quarters is, is more for, you know, the captains when they're doing any kind of work. You can see his small desk here. Lewis, more often than not, would have been maybe charting what that particular day's travels mm -hmm. had been. He might have been gathering and looking over some of his plant specimens. But what the men oftentimes did in the night is they would pull the shore anchor the boats, leave a guard on duty, and then they would tent camp in the evening. So the bunks mm -hmm. here might be for a man who was too sick that particular day, certainly for one of the I captains. See. So you're exactly right. I mean, very, very nice quarters, yeah. but not for everyone to stay all the time. Right, and not big enough to house 43 men. No, but they certainly could, not. But during the day, they, they, there's a certain amount of work they could be right. doing 
to get ready for when they get off the boat and go do exploring and those right. kinds of things. Well, if you consider the sheer size of this particular boat, if you can imagine pulling this boat up river mark every oh day, God. you know, pulling against the corn, yeah. pulling, pulling, oh. rowing, you're going to get a strain. You're going to get a muscle ache. feet long, an exactly. immense, heavy thing. Exactly. And 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 the and the Missouri River in some places was pretty pretty brisk. It was. So you had a you had a you had a, a current that you had to go against pretty pretty strong. Very much a wild river. Very much a wild mm -hmm. river, and not to the point where today we have nice navigable channels. Mm -hmm. This boat is moving here to there, avoiding snags, avoiding sandbars. Mm -hmm. It's moving close to the shoreline because if they can't pull it. They're going to take a rope at the front of the boat, and they're going to pull the boat oh, along God. the river. So you've got four ways to move this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the they couldn't sails, bring any mules with them. They had no. to use manpower. Exactly. And the sail is here in place, but the prevailing winds, more often than not, are not in your mm -hmm. favor. Now, what are we looking at here? Lots of barrels. Lots of barrels. You know, barrels back then are, are kind of your Tupperware of the time period, mm -hmm. so to speak, because you can put about anything you can think of in a barrel. It's not just for liquid. Anytime you see metal bands around a barrel, that's going to indicate that this is a wet barrel or designed to hold water. Mm -hmm. Now, in this case, this is your whiskey stores. So every man on the expedition would receive a gill or a jill of whiskey a day, which is a quarter pint of whiskey. Pint. And they carried 18 kegs of whiskey on them uh, or with them wow. on the expedition. So besides that, you've got dry barrels, which are going to have more of a, of a, uh, a wood band around them that are going to ship flour, cornmeal, mm -hmm. uh, plates, dishes, whatever you can think of, will either be shipped in a crate or a barrel that they're mm -hmm. going to bring with them on the expedition. So they carried a lot of, and we know most of what they're carrying because they're having to buy most of these materials from places in the east or from St. Louis and in Cahokia. And that's Cahokia, Illinois. Again, a connection to Illinois and the Lewis mm -hmm. and Clark story. Mm -hmm. And Cahokia was one of those villages that was populated by white people a long time ago. Absolutely. So there, were, there was a settlement there, yeah. and in St. Louis as well. Absolutely. Cahokia actually predates St. Louis, so mm -hmm. there was a vibrant trade community already in St. Louis or I'm sorry, already in Cahokia before mm -hmm. St. Louis is ever established. So what Lewis and Clark will do is when they arrive into the Illinois country in, in, the, in the winter, basically in December of 1803, Lewis uses Cahokia as his base of operation. He uses the traders, he uses the businessmen in Cahokia to make the introductions that he's going to need in the St. Louis community to gather whatever information is possible and make the introductions for whatever mm -hmm. traders and travelers he's going to need to buy the final mm -hmm. supplies. Now, one of the things I asked you, th this is a knockout, by the way, this, this keel boat, but there's a lot more than that here. One of the things I asked you to make sure that we didn't miss was the, the maps and how little was known about the state of Illinois at the time. Correct. And not only did they not know anything about the, the Missouri Valley, they didn't know much about Illinois. And so we're going to see what, what, you know, what, what the state of things were there. And we also have to identify Lewis and Clark. And you have some really good portraits of them. So let's get a look at them, talk about them a little bit, and then about the experience they got when they first arrived in Illinois. Great. Well, if you retrace Lewis and Clark's trip, like you recently did yourself, you'll see sculptures along the way, won't you? Absolutely. And this third figure, this seaman, their dog, he's well documented, isn't he? Absolutely. You know, there's probably more books written about the, the dog's journey than there may be even about the two <laughs> captains' journey. He's a very, very famous dog on the expedition, probably one of the most famous dogs in our history. Mm -hmm. But uh, he's, a, he's a Newfoundland. He's a black Newfoundland, as we know from the journals, and gets into all kinds of trouble on the trail. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll bet he was invaluable as well because, I mean, when you need a water dog, you need a water dog. Absolutely. Newfoundlands are known for the fact that they have webbing in their, in their, between their, their, their pads, mm -hmm. so they're good swimmers, but as a guard dog, he's, he's essential to the success I, of this I expedition. I wouldn't be surprised if he saved a life or two along the way. I'm sure he did, and I know <laughs> he kept him from being overrun by a buffalo stampede at one point. Is that so right? He's, he's awakened the whole party in the middle of the night somewhere in the Dakotas, and, and they are woken to this huge heard of stampede, if you will, of buffaloes running basically right through the middle he of the camp. He alerted them and they got out of the way. They did, oh, yeah. Okay. yeah so Let's walk around behind okay. and take a look at these gentlemen. Okay. We've, got some, we've got some portraits over here which show us a real good idea of, of these two individuals and what they looked like. These, of course, there was no photography then, but, but this is a good portrait of, uh, of, of, of Clark. And uh, what did he bring to the expedition? Well, Clark is, is, the, is the typical, if you will, kind of the, the younger brother. If you can imagine that, that George Rogers Clark, who is a Civil War, not a Civil War, but an American uh, Revolutionary War mm -hmm. veteran, hero of the Illinois country during the American Revolution, is, is William Clark's older brother. So the family's looking to William Clark in 1803 saying, well, you know, William, what have you, what have you done with your life? So William is, is the perfect man to, who kind of overcome that challenge of, of the younger brother in the family. But as an explorer, as an army man, as a surveyor, he is essential.
essential to the success of this expedition. Okay, so he's surveying is what he's he's known for. Absolutely, okay. surveyor and, it, and a good judge of men. When you're going into the unknown, you got to be able to know where you are, right? And right. Then you got to choose the right people to get you there. Right. Okay, and what about uh, what about Clark or Rogers over here? Well, this is what Lewis. Meriwether Lewis, Lewis is right. actually the personal secretary of Thomas Jefferson. So at the age of 29 in 1803, Lewis is asked by President Jefferson to command this expedition to mm -hmm. explore the western lands, or as we later called the Louisiana Purchase. So Lewis is picked in part because, as, as Jefferson says, he shows courage undaunted. So basically, he is the perfect thinker. He's the scientist. He's the man that is sent to Philadelphia to be trained in botany, to be trained in mineralogy, to be mm -hmm. trained in the sciences. So for Jefferson, he can paint a very clear picture as to what's lying to the western lands, to those lands mm -hmm. in Louisiana, those lands we just recently purchased for $15 million. One, one's a navigator, and the other one's going to identify what they actually find when they get there. Absolutely. So oftentimes, Clark stays with the boats. Lewis will go off with his dog, of course, Seaman, <laughs> off on his own, gathering a plant specimen, gathering an animal species. Mm -hmm. In all, they'll discover over 300 different plants and animal species that had never been wow. seen before by anyone probably other than American Indians. Brad, in 1803, when they started this journey, there were a lot of question marks, weren't they, about what lay ahead? Absolutely. <laughs> this map represents the extent of what was known of North America at the time of the expedition in 1803. So if you can see, we're located right about here. This okay. is the confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri River, the Hartford, Illinois. Hartford, Illinois. Hartford, Illinois, okay. exactly right. right. The Illinois River, for folks, is right up here. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine, this was where they started from. Yeah. And their first leg of the journey would take them up was known of the Missouri River, mm -hmm north to today, present day North Dakota, where they would build Mandan or Fort Mandan Village. But if you look at the map to the west of that, look how little information There's is about. Almost nothing. They knew there was a mountain range. They speculated there was a there, mountain oh, okay, range. Okay, because there were streams coming off it, so that's why they speculated. But again, pure speculation, yeah, because yeah. anyone who has seen the Rocky Mountains before will know that this is not a single range of mountains. Mm -hmm. So you've got this, this obscure potential mountain range but the hope is, is that this Missouri River, once you finish charting it, will connect somewhere to a large body of water on the west coast, either the Columbia River, mm -hmm. somewhere around Vancouver. That Northwest Passage is what they were looking yeah. for, that bridging route that would connect the Pacific Ocean in the west to the Atlantic Ocean And in it's the remarkable, east. there was no such Northwest Passage, but they still made it. That's right, <laughs> that's right. And, and, and it's amazing to me to envision what was in their minds because the only mountain range these men have ever seen in their lives, if they have, is the Appalachian Mountain Range. Oh, so as they goodness. approach the Rockies, and if you've seen the Rockies... Oh, they're not prepared for the they're Rockies. They're not. They're mm -hmm. not prepared for those mountains every day rising higher and higher, and then snow begins to appear on the peak mm -hmm. of those mountains. And again, you cross that first range hoping for a nice river valley waiting for you. Mm -hmm. And if you look to the west, once you cross the first range of the mountains, what's waiting for you is more mountains. So yeah. Yeah. it had to be terribly discouraging for them. Brad, that keel boat looks pretty familiar. I think we've seen that before, haven't we? Absolutely, yeah. That's, that's the keel boat that was built in Pittsburgh. Uh, Lewis commissioned that boat to be built especially for this expedition. So this map shows that there is an eastern legacy to the Lewis and Clark Trail that mm -hmm. leads us up to Illinois. And here you can see the men moving the keel boat down the Ohio River with mm -hmm. the help of the current, which is important because once they move up the Mississippi in 1803, that's the last time they're going to have the current at their backs for uh -huh. another two years. Wow. So coming down the Ohio, Lewis will meet Clark in Clarksville, Indiana, in the Louisville, Kentucky area, and spend mm -hmm. about five or six days there. And then they begin that trek through Indiana and then reaching Illinois in November of 1803. And that would be down, that down would be about here. Exactly, right? and stopping for just a few days at Fort Massac. Okay. So Fort Massac today is in Metropolis, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing there is gathering men and gathering supplies and information. So you can imagine that Lewis and Clark arrive at Fort Massac in November of 1803 mm -hmm. with orders to recruit men from the garrison. Well, unfortunately, again, being in Metropolis, Superman was unavailable for the expedition. <laughs> so they're going to go ahead and recruit a couple key members of the expedition at Massac, spend a few more days in Acaro, and then move their way up the Missi Mississippi River, mm -hmm. okay. stopping at Fort Kaskaskia. Okay. Kaskaskia is in Chester, Illinois. And again, Popeye was unavailable for the expedition. <laughs> but they're going to move farther up than to Cahokia, as we talked about Lewis's base of operations right. is in Cahokia. Mm -hmm. Now, the intent was to establish a camp on the west side of the Mississippi River, farther up the Missouri River, the hope was. So when Lewis arrives in Cahokia, he is going to St. Louis mm -hmm. to request permission to establish his first winter encampment in the Louisiana Territory. But unfortunately for Lewis, as he's the bringer of much of the news of this Louisiana purchase mm -hmm. to the Spanish Lieutenant Governor there in St. Louis, 
He needs to confirm those orders first before he's going to allow Lewis any chance to move into the Louisiana Territory. So Lewis is denied permission to move any farther west than the Mississippi River. Because of that, Lewis is told of a location along a small stream called the Riviere du Bois, okay. or the Wood River. Okay, and we it, see that right here. Exactly. And that Wood River is conveniently enough right across from the confluence of the Mississippi mm -hmm. and Missouri and, and River. And there's the Missouri, so that's where that comes in. Correct. And if they're on Dubois River, this would be their encampment here. That's right. And that's now Hartford. That's correct. And that's where we're standing right now. That's exactly right. And then they're looking right to the river they're going to ascend the following spring. Mm -hmm. So if you can't move up the Missouri River, it's the best spot that you can pick one directly across. Fascinating about the communications in those days. Okay, so the French sell this immense territory to the United States, but, the, but Spain hasn't been told yet. Right. And so the Spanish governor tells Lewis and Clark, nope, no, can't camp here. No, no. I mean, <laughs> if you can imagine being the bearer of this kind of news, it would be like us traveling to, to Toronto and saying, well, we've bought a part of Canada today. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, of course, they're going to confirm those orders, and news doesn't travel as fast as oh, it does today. Remarkable. So it's going to take three or four months. In fact, it would not be until March of 1804, so almost an entire year mm -hmm. after the treaty was signed, that the land would be exchanged from the Spanish first to the French, and then the French in turn selling it mm -hmm. us to the United States, what they call the three flag ceremonies, which Lewis and Clark will witness in March of 1804. Uh -huh. So a lot had to happen before this expedition could yeah. even begin. Yeah. Well, Brad, you couldn't take on an expedition like this with, with just 40 mopes. I mean, you gotta have the right guys. Right. Because it's, you don't know how long it's gonna take. You're in the mid, absolutely in the middle of nowhere, and you got to have people that have skills and know how to use those skills in environments you don't even know what they are yet. So you got to pick people that are flexible, skilled, and ready to go. Right. Exactly. Let's let's start with just even the most basic of needs, and that's food. Mm -hmm. Here, Clark's got to figure out. All right, I need men that are good hunters because your sole source of food is you can't stop at a local fast food restaurant in the middle of North Dakota and pick up a meal. That's for sure. You're gonna have to hunt every day for your meal. You're gonna have to fish almost every day for your meal. So Clark needs men who can handle themselves in the woods, who mm -hmm. can fish, who can gather food for, as it turns out, 43 men on this expedition mm -hmm. that will consume something between six to seven pounds of meat per man per day. Per so you're gonna day. need per day. And if you can imagine, that's a lot of food. Wow. But keep in mind, as we've talked about, the keel boat. You've got to pull that boat against yeah, the current. Working, they are working hard. They're working yeah. six out of seven days a week, yeah. and they're expending yeah. a tremendous amount of energy six burning seven calendars. Pounds of meat a day. It's not wow. like these guys were all overweight. They're going to yeah. lose probably oh, more I'll weight bet. than they yeah. started with. Oh, man. But Clark's also got to figure out all right, I need men who can keep the boats in good working mm -hmm. order. I need skilled yep. craftsmen. I need people who are navigators. I need people who are boatmen, because yeah. this was an expedition that was going to spend probably 75% of its time on a river. Uh -huh. So you need to keep these boats in good yeah. working order. Well, you're also going to need a blacksmith. If you're going to be mm -hmm. hunting almost every day for your food, you better hope that those guns are in good working yeah. order. Yeah. You better need a carpenter, because if the boat starts to leak, if you're going to build a winter encampment, mm -hmm. you're going to need someone who's good at boat building as mm -hmm. well as cabin construction. Yep. Well, you're hunting every day for food. You better have somebody who can cook it for you. So yep. these are the types of skills that Clark needs to identify in the men who are candidates or volunteers while they're here at Camp River Dubois. The big part of our story is, all right, take this group of, say, 50 men and whittle it down into something that you can bring with you on this expedition, a, a manageable size. But more importantly than that, a group that can work together as a team. Mm -hmm. That's the second part of the equation. These men have to learn to trust each other. They have to learn to know each other. They're going to be together all the time. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. For our, as it turns out, two years, four months, and nine days, they're going to be together. And yeah. they're going to need to know that I can come to you if I have an issue that your particular skill yeah. requires. Um, they're also going to need to know that if you've got my back. If you're on guard mm -hmm. duty that night, you're not going to fall asleep. You're not going to wander off. You're going to have my back the entire mm -hmm. way. And mm -hmm. that was an essential part of the training. They could have picked up and just taken off and moved up the Missouri River. But I don't think they would have had the near kind of success had they not had their time spent here yeah. getting to know each other. Yeah. Well, Brad, you can only take the keel boat so far. And then the Missouri River gets, I guess, just too too shallow and too narrow and too swift maybe to get it up any further? Right, absolutely. You've got to think, and this is again part of that process they had to go through to say, okay, what am I going to need to carry as many of the supplies as possible as mm -hmm. far as I possibly can take them by water? So you've got the keelboat, again 55 feet long. The mm -hmm. keelboat was intended only to go as far as Fort Mandan. 
you know, that's where it's going to gather whatever remaining supplies and, they and, need. And shoot, that's South Dakota? or That's North Dakota. North Dakota, North Dakota. North Dakota. Okay. right, right. Mm -hmm. Fort Mandan in North Dakota. From that point there in the spring of 1805, they're going to transfer the remaining cargo into the two P-Rows, the red P-Row and the white P-Row. Mm -hmm. The red P-Row is about 40 feet long. The white P-Row is about 30 to 35 mm -hmm. feet long. And again, we don't know because the only images we have is basically a small description in the journals. Yeah. But these become the flagships for the expedition. Mm -hmm. As they're traveling west, they're heading into territory that is completely unexplored. And they keep hearing about this, this waterfall or series of waterfalls mm -hmm. that they'll eventually find in a place today we call Great Falls, Montana. Mm -hmm. When they reach the falls of the Missouri River, they have to decide, all right, we can't possibly portage these two large boats over the falls. And the falls, plural, being there are five actual wow. sets of waterfalls. So imagine, in the middle of the summer of 1805, you've got a portage close to 20 tons of cargo, if you want to bring it with you, over these series of falls. Mm -hmm. There's no cover. It's nothing but rocky ground and prickly pear cactus bushes. Mm -hmm and you suddenly got to move all these supplies over these series of falls wow. and transfer them into dugout canoes, which okay. you're going to have to construct. Okay, so you start making these. Exactly. And God knows how many you're going to need because you've got all these men and all this stuff. Right. <laughs> this is a very, very small dugout canoe. So if mm -hmm. you can imagine, a typical dugout practically then would have been almost double in length yeah. and probably double in width. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to set men aside to constructing these. You're going to have to set men aside to portaging supplies. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind, it's the middle of the summer and you're staring at the Rocky Mountains and you're seeing snow at the top. Yeah. So your thought process is, I've got to get this done quickly because I don't know how much time I'm going to be able yeah. to get through those mountains before we yeah. get snowed in. And, and there were other boats that they attempted and, and just didn't flat, didn't work out. Right. I mean, they were thinking ahead. Right. They had, the, they had built this frame of uh, what this iron frame boat? Right. You know, you mentioned that Lewis was kind of the thinker. So Lewis in his preparations in, in the spring of 1803, two years ahead of time, is thinking at some point I'm going to need a boat. I'm going to need a boat quickly. So he carries 200 pounds of iron with him in this oh frame. So when they reach the Great Falls, of course, you can imagine Lewis is excited because he's going to have an opportunity mm -hmm. to prove that this iron frame boat works. So he builds the boat, he takes animal skins and wraps it around, he puts it in the river, and as you can imagine, it sinks. It sinks almost immediately because they don't have pine trees. There are no pine trees nearby where they can har harvest the pitch that is going to be mm -hmm. needed to seal mm -hmm. this boat watertight. So talk about disappointment. Disappointment in the fact that you carried 200 pounds of iron only to have it just simply be wasted. My goodness. Um, <laughs> it was one of those points oh. in the expedition I can't imagine low, being in the mine. Low, low point. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And after your men are already tired and exhausted from spending a month they hadn't planned on, yeah portaging these supplies over the falls. Yeah. Oh. What they ended up doing is leaving the two Piros behind. They cached those supplies that they left behind in the Piros and then traveled on to the west. When they return in 1806, only the white Piro is still salvageable. The other boat is too badly damaged over the year's time, mm -hmm. so they do what minor repairs to the white Piro are necessary, and then that becomes the small or the boat that brings it all the way back to St. Louis. Mm -hmm. So what started as the smallest boat on the expedition became the largest boat on the way home. One of the questions I asked was, were there any females on the uh, expedition? And I was told that um, there was one washerwoman. She did the laundry uh, here for the five months they were, they were at Camp, uh, Camp Dubois. And then they left her behind because they needed, needed tougher specimens for the trip. This is the village, the camp that they built for the five month stay. Welcome Mike, to thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. And, and you are, Dressed as one of these, one of the uh, the members, the crew members. I I'm guess. I'm dressed huh? as uh, Private John Coulter. Uh -huh. I'm a private in the United States Army. I was recruited up along the Virginia area and came down the Ohio River with uh, Captain uh, Meriwether Lewis uh -huh. on the keelboat. Yeah, and, and you have a distinction of having wanted to stay with the expedition even after they got home. I didn't want to come home to civilization. <laughs> I wanted to go back and trap beaver. Oh, that's hilarious. So I, I, uh, we had a chance encounter with two fur traders, and. Uh, I asked the captains, and they said you could go if no one else wants to go. So mm -hmm. nobody else wanted to nobody go. Else they wanted all wanted to, to come back to civilization. Yeah. I, however, wanted to go back up river, yeah. and I did. This camp is a replica of what was built while they were preparing for the expedition. Yes, they correct. lived here for five months, yes, correct. and this is a four cabins, sort of anchored by this wooden fence that goes around. And if you would, Mike, take me inside sure. one of these because this is a typical quarters of the 40-some men who would have lived here for five months getting ready for the expedition. And my question was, how did they all sleep here? Well, it's very Spartan, as you can see, Mark, but we had 
large bunks and they slept two to a bunk, head, feet, head, feet. Mm -hmm. And we also, uh, you had kind of the uh, primitive fireplace in here, a fire ring, uh, to keep mm -hmm. them somewhat warm because yeah. recall they came here in December and uh, they felled a lot of timber and they were under roof in about eight days. That's that's amazing. Yes, eight is. days they built this. Well, of course, if it was December, yep. you'd work pretty fast if you, you wanted would, to you, stay out of the you weather, wouldn't you? You had incentive. You had yeah. great incentive to get out of the yeah. weather. Some of this is obviously nicer than other parts. Now, that's pretty Spartan living there. Yes. In the center of this camp is a, a little a little nicer place, the guards room. And of course, the captains had had an area here that's a little nicer. Now, it's very dark in there, and we can't shoot in there. Right. but. You, I, I, you can rest assured that the, the quarters were a little bit better for the captains. Nicer quarters for the captains. They had some of their equipment in there. Captain Clark was the uh, cartographer, the map maker mm -hmm. uh, for the journey. And he had uh, some fairly sophisticated navigational instruments, which he kept in there. Captain Lewis was, uh, he was also the medical guy for the expedition. Mm -hmm. He learned frontier medicine from his mother. And so he had uh, some medicines that he kept in there. Also in the back, they had a storeroom and there where they s kept supplies for the expedition. And also they had already charted out gifts for each Indian tribe, which they kept oh, in the storeroom. Right, so they were prepared for everything. They were they? organized, they knew many of the Indian tribes that were that people the Missouri River. And so they had knew what they would what they would gift to the Indians. Uh -huh. That was expected. Yeah. I want to end this segment by looking up just over your shoulder to this flag up here. And this was an unusual flag because they didn't have the 13 bars the way we do now. They had 15 bars. Very interesting. Well, we didn't have all of our states. We didn't have mm -hmm. our 48 states or even our 50 states. We didn't have the Star Spangled Banner. Yep. They sang uh, Chester when the <laughs> flag was raised. <laughs> and you know what? I don't know who Chester was, but he was probably a fine but fellow from the state it. of Maine. But that's what they sang. Yeah. Didn't have the Star Spangled Banner and didn't have all, all the yeah. stars and bars at that time. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. You are invited to visit the Lewis and Clark State Historic Site Wednesday through Sunday during the winter months from 9 to 5. And that would include Camp Dubois, where I sit now, at Meriwether Lewis's desk, looking at his journal and, and checking out his, the peace medals that they gave to the Indians, his science books medicines, and of course, the brandy that they had for the, uh, for the crew. With another Illinois story in Hartford, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.